guys, welcome to another episode of U.S. History with Lennox, and today we're talking about the 1800s in America. Now, the 1800s was a real transitional period on several fronts for the United States. We were growing both politically and economically, and we were still trying to discover what our identity was. We see a lot of twists and turns as we go through the 1800s, but one of these big turns, one of these ones that you kind of throw you off to the side is gonna be the Mexican-American War, because this is gonna put us on the path directly towards the U.S. Civil War. So let's get into it and let's try to understand how important the Mexican-American War was to the second half of the 1800s. Now, when we look at the 1800s, one of the biggest characteristics is going to be the expansion of our country. Manifest destiny has become the motto of the Americans. We want to expand, we want to grow, and we believe that we have the divine providence of God to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean. We're not just supposed to settle at the Rocky Mountains where the Louisiana Territory is. We're supposed to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And so that's going to be a lot of the motivating factors that guide us as we move forward. Now, Texas is one of these key areas that was kind of in our way. See, Texas was part of originally Spain and now Mexico because in 1821, Mexico had gained its independence from Spain and now it controlled all that land going west. Now, the new Mexican government wanting to get a good start initially set up what we call a free trade policy with the United States. And what does that mean? It means we're going to trade for free. No tariffs, no taxes, nothing. Texas also is going to present a lot of opportunities for Americans. Land speculators are going to go down there seeking out cheap land that can be used for ranching and agriculture. Cotton is going to play a key role in the growth of Texas. When Mexico was first established as a country, it was established as a federal republic, very similar to the United States. They practiced that foundational idea of federalism, the division of power between states and the central government. And if you look at this map here, Mexico was divided up into a lot of different states. And all of those states had their own local governments. Texas was seen as an opportunity. Now, one thing Mexico needed to do was populate this territory. The reason why is it's much easier to hold on to a land that's populated versus one that's not. I mean, think back to the uh, French Indian War when France had control of all the land in North America, but they didn't actually control it because no one lived there. So it was very easy for us to take it as English citizens. Well, Texas is kind of the same way. So what's going to happen is Mexico is going to start offering land grants or cheap or free land to Anglo settlers, meaning Americans. Some people who took advantage of this, Stephen Austin and Sam Houston. They're known as the founding fathers of Texas. And if you want to hear some cool stories, go ahead and read up on them. But this is American history, not Texas history, so I got to move on. Mexico was established, like I said, in 1821. And if we look at a timeline, you're going to see some changes that are going to affect the Americans who moved to Texas with people like Stephen Austin. 1823, that's when the land grants started to be offered to American settlers. And so you're going to see a number of Americans move down there. But in 1834, the government starts to change. That's when Santa Ana comes in and he creates this dictatorship over Mexico. And because of that, the Texans or the Americans living in Texas are going to be moved to start a revolution for their own independence. The Texas Revolution actually started before Santa Ana. I guess if you want to pinpoint a time when this revolution would began, look at when the Americans first arrived in Texas because they were constantly going against the Mexican government. They ignored completely that Mexico had made slavery illegal. I mean, they just brought their slaves with them. On top of that, they refused to convert to Catholicism, which was one of the conditions of those land grants. Catholicism was the state religion of Mexico, and if you were a citizen of Mexico, which the Texans were, they were expected to convert to that religion. Well, the Texans didn't want to do that. On top of that, after a while, that free trade agreement with America kind of went away because both countries realized that they were giving away money. 
it was a great foundational way to start their economic relationship. But now you're starting to see tariffs starting to be put into play from both countries. But the Americans who had migrated to Texas, they felt, why should we pay taxes on American goods? I mean, aren't we technically Americans? Well, no, you're not. You're Texans. But that's, I guess, beside the point. 1834, Santa Ana is going to come in, and he's going to start enforcing these rules. Now, yes, he is creating a dictatorship, but the Texans really didn't want to deal with that. In fact, what they really wanted is what they had before. They wanted self-rule just in Texas. And so that's what they're going to start fighting for, is their own independence. Now, the Republic of Texas, this independent Texas nation, is going to start in 1836 when the Texans declare their independence from Mexico and wrote their own constitution. But Mexico is not just going to roll over and say, oh, okay, you're free, see you later. No, there's going to be a war, and this is going to be the Texas Revolution. Now, it didn't start off too well for the Texans. Quite honestly, they're going to be defeated at the Alamo and defeated at Goliad. But finally, things flip in their favor at the Battle of San Jacinto. It's here that they actually capture Santa Ana and negotiate their independence. Now, the treaty that's negotiated is negotiated while Santa Ana was technically a prisoner of war. So the Mexican government is going to argue that he was under duress when he signed it. But regardless, he is going to recognize Texas independence as well as grant the land of Texas, the state of Texas, all the way south to the Rio Grande River. That will be the southern border. Now, the Mexican government's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You gave away too much land. Now, we understand you were a prisoner. I guess it makes sense that you did that. But the Mexican government's going to try to come back on Texas and say, hey, Bro, listen, the border is not the Rio Grande. The border is the Nuestas River because that was the original border of your state. So that's the border we're going to recognize. Texas is like, uh-uh, we got a signed document. Rio is a, is a southern border. At the same time, Texas is calling on the United States saying, hey, we would love to join you guys. It was during Jackson's presidency that Texas is going to petition for annexation into the United States. But the U.S. government isn't so keen on bringing Texas in at this point for two reasons. Number one, that border dispute they're having with Mexico. I mean, the last thing America needs in the 1830s, and if you think about it, 1837, we're kind of going through an economic panic, the beginnings of it, really can't afford a war at this point. But more importantly, bringing Texas in is really going to upset the balance of power in our government, specifically in the Senate. Coming out of the War of 1812, we had an equal number of slave states and free states within the Senate. Now, as the war ended and as British troops started to move out of the United States, you started to see more westward expansion. That's kind of when Manifest Destiny started to take hold and new states are going to come in. Well, by the time Texas petitions for, it, um, for statehood, we have an unbalance of power in the Senate. We have more slave states than free states. And so bringing in yet another slave state, because that's what Texas would be, is really going to upset things. It's going to upset a lot of people in the free states, because that balance of power, if you go back, that's what we wanted to maintain when we first signed the uh, Missouri Compromise. So... Texas is not going to actually have the right timing, I guess, to come into the United States in 1836. So slavery is what delays Texas from becoming part of our union. And when Texas realizes they're not going to get in, they kind of start having to do things on their own. And one of the first things they do is look for other allies. The biggest ally they find is Great Britain. Great Britain loves the idea of an independent Texas. And the reason why? Texas is growing a lot of cotton, and if Great Britain can form an alliance with Texas, it's almost like they get in a monopoly on Texas cotton, which would kind of be an economic coup. But Texas still wants to be part of the Union. I mean, they're doing all this stuff as their own nation, but the ultimate goal is to get back into or get into the United States. And so Texas becoming part of the Union is going to become the center focus of the presidential election of 1844. 
Going into this election, John Tyler, the sitting president, he's not going to run again. He was seen as a, what, what did he do? He ran as a Democrat, but he's also seen as a Whig. The Democrats didn't want him because he vetoed a lot of the action that the Democratic Congress took. The Whigs didn't want him because he kind of turned his back on them when he joined the Democrats. So two brand new candidates, well, one brand new candidate and one recycled candidate are going to be running in 1844. James K. Polk is going to represent the Democrats, and our buddy Henry Clay is back once again representing the Whigs. Like I said, the biggest issue, westward expansion, and Polk was all about expansion. Clay, not so much. When we look at James K. Polk, I'm gonna, let me just break it to you, he wins. He's the 11th president of the United States, a Democrat from the state of Tennessee. No one saw this guy coming politically. Yeah, he had been part of the House of Representatives. He had worked hand in hand with Andrew Jackson in the defeating of the National Bank. You know, as a Jacksonian Democrat, he's going to get a lot of support once he gets the nomination. It took nine votes in the Democratic Convention before Polk became the candidate. Once he's nominated, he does get the backing of Andrew Jackson. He runs on that platform, like I said, of annexing Texas and expanding our country all the way to the Pacific. Polk is known as the Manifest Destiny President. He also says he's going to reduce uh, tariffs, which is going to make people in the South very happy, and he promises to complete Manifest Destiny. Not just get Texas, but get us all the way to California. And California was really seen as the great prize. And he goes, I'm going to get us all the way to California, and I'm going to get us Oregon. Remember how we had that agreement with, with Great Britain, how we were going to share Oregon? Polk's like, eh, no more. We're going to take it all. And he promises to do this in four years. Yeah, he says, I'm just going to be a one-term president. Can you imagine if someone ran today and said, yeah, I'm just going to be here for one term. Four years, it's all I'm going to do. It's all I need to get things done. That's what Polk said he was going to do. And the people loved it. And he's going to win, and Henry Clay is going to go down in defeat again. But, you know, you shouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's just the Clay way of life. 1845, Texas is annexed. Polk's first promise comes to fruition, except it wasn't Polk who did it. In fact, it was John Tyler who annexed Texas. He is going to annex Texas, sign it into as a state, just literally days before Polk takes office. I guess it's John Tyler's way of saying, yeah, you should have put me up, and I'm kind of mad you didn't, but I'm going to steal your thunder. And that's what he did. He stole the thunder. But Texas becomes part of the Union, and quite honestly, we give Polk the credit because he's the one who campaigned on it. On top of that, when we annexed Texas, we did it with certain conditions you should probably be familiar with. Um, number one, Texas never had to be a territory. All other states coming in the Union had to be a territory first. Texas, not so much. We actually said when we brought Texas in, man, it's so big, let's divide it up into five different states, kind of like we did with the Northwest Territory. Well, as I'm sure you're aware of by now, at least I hope you are, Texas was not divided up into more states. Texas had a lot of debt coming in. It had been its own republic for nine years. I think about $10 million in debt. They said, we'll pay it if you let us come in. So the U.S. government said, you can come in, but you pay your own debt. They got to retain their own public lands. And the Missouri Compromise from 1820, well, based on where that 3630 line, Texas is going to come in as a slave state. And there didn't seem to be much debate about that at the time. I guess nine years makes a big difference. Once we got Texas, we wanted more land. And one of the first places we're going to look is that Oregon Territory. Remember, Polk had said, I'm going to get Oregon, all of it, from Great Britain. Well, one of his campaign slogans was 5440 or fight. That represented the latitude line of the northernmost point of the Oregon Territory. If you look at the map on the screen, all that green, he said, I'm going to get it all. And if I don't get it all, I'm going to go to war with Great Britain. Well, we're not going to go to war, but we have a very solid claim to the land since we had thousands of Americans living out there by way of the Oregon Trail. In the end, we negotiate the 49th parallel as the new northern border of Oregon. It still exists today, and boom, the Oregon Territory is now part of the United States. Another campaign promise delivered. So now what? 
Polk said there's four great measures that I have to get done. Reduction of tariff, independent treasury. Yeah, he gets those done. The settlement of Oregon, got that done. And California, let's go get it. We want more land. We're going to get it. The way we're going to try to do it is buy it. I mean, why not? That makes sense. So Polk is going to send John Slidell down to Mexico and say, make him an offer. $25 million for all the land that you have in North America. Sounds like a good deal. Mexico said, nope. In fact, Mexico said, we still have a problem, United States. We still have this disputed territory down in Texas that is technically ours. The last thing Polk wants is a dispute with Mexico over that border in Texas. I mean, we had a treaty that said the Rio is the southern border. And so under Polk's administration, he goes, we're going to protect that. He's going to send Zachary Taylor down to the territory between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande with the orders to protect that land from any movement of Mexican troops into that territory. So that's what Taylor does. He sets up camp just north of the Rio Grande, and he'll start sending out patrols to make sure that Mexican soldiers are not crossing. They really believe that they would try to cross down there near the Gulf of Mexico, more so than the northern part. This is going to lead to what's known as the Thornton Affair. Seth Thornton was a captain in the U.S. Army, and Taylor had sent him and his troops out to patrol the area. As they moved into the territory near Palo Alto, they are going to be ambushed by Mexican troops. Thornton had about 80 men under his charge, and those who weren't killed instantly were taken prisoner of war by the Mexican army. When that happens and when Polk gets word of that, he is going to ask Congress for a declaration of war against Mexico. And he gets it, but not without a little bit of pushback by the Whigs. The Whigs were against this war, and they questioned Polk's motives. One of the Whigs who did question it is going to be Abraham Lincoln, a very young Abraham Lincoln. As a representative from the state of Illinois, he is going to ask for the spot resolution. And the spot resolution basically said this, I want to know the exact spot where American blood was spilled so we can know whether or not we should go to war. Well, the spot resolution doesn't pass, but the declaration of war does. And so now... We are fighting with Mexico for control of not only the disputed territory of Texas, but also all that other land we want. So we fought, obviously, for the disputed area of Texas. I mean, Taylor's down there. He might as well continue the fight. And then he'll go ahead and move into northern Texas. Guys, I got to be honest. American troops met with very little resistance during this war. Not only did we take northern Mexico, we also took... New Mexico, under the command of Stephen Kearney. California, our big prize, is going to be taken by John C. Fremont, which is very interesting because Fremont did not go in there under the guise of a military expedition. He and his troops went in there as a scientific expedition. While there, they came across some Americans in the territory who were encouraged to maybe fight for their independence against Mexico. This is known as the Bear Flag Revolt. The Americans are going to successfully overthrow the Mexican government. And when that happens, we're at war with Mexico. So that's when John C. Fremont goes, goes ahead and joins up with them. At the same time, Winfield Scott is making his way across Mexico through Veracruz, and he will take Mexico City. This was not a difficult fight for the United States. In California, once they got control, they actually were their own state for a while. It was called the Bear Flag Republic. And for three glorious weeks, California was not part of the United States. They were their own nation. But mostly Americans living out there, so they want to join the Union. It's going to happen. Once we occupied Mexico City, our victory was guaranteed. And this is when we're going to negotiate the treaty. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. This treaty is going to be signed in 1848, and this is going to cede all the Mexican land north of, you guessed it, the Rio Grande River. When you look at the conditions of the treaty, they're going to give us New Mexico, California, and finally recognize the Rio as the southern border of Texas. 
We're going to give them $15 million for their trouble. That's about the same amount we paid for the Louisiana Purchase. And then later, we're actually going to negotiate another treaty called the Gadsden Purchase, where we purchase a small strip of land in southern Arizona for about $10 million. So with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase, that's about $25 million, which is pretty much what we offered when Slidell went down to Mexico City. Just saying. This is the land we got from the Gadsden Purchase. You can see it's in the southern part of Arizona and a little bit of New Mexico. The main reason we wanted this land was for the Transcontinental Railroad. This would be the optimal region in the west to build a southern route of the Transcontinental Railroad. So this would be very beneficial for us in the future. So now when we look at the territorial acquisitions, man, manifest destiny. We got it all. Done, done, and done. This map kind of breaks down each piece of land that we brought into our country. But in the end, Polk lived up to all his promises. He got Oregon. He got California. He did reduce the tariffs, and he set up an independent treasury, among other things. But the question is, now what? What do we do with this land? And this is going to be interesting. But we'll talk about that on the next one. Guys, thanks for listening. If you missed anything, you can always rewind. If you have any questions, just put them down in the comments. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.